good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on which part of the world you're in. Uh, it's a joy again to be uh, back here with us. And uh, just share, uh, just build up on what I started sharing yesterday on moving forward in hope. And uh, we looked at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 from verse 1, five, one to 5. Um, and uh, I will read the scriptures just for purposes of just refreshing our minds again. Let me read 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1 to 5. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of the world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And verse five, we demolish arguments and pretensions that set itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Amen. So, Yesterday, I just began by introducing uh, my experience um, as, a, as a young person getting into the camp world and just what impact it had on me. Um, I shared with us five challenges uh, of moving forward in hope. Uh, challenge number one being the flow of the church. Uh, when, when Christ walked the world and the, the church was born in that sense, uh, the church was very countercultural and rose on a lot of conflict, uh, especially with the, with the known leaders of the time. Uh, but the church was spiritual, it was anointed, it, signs, miracles, and, and wonders were happening. And some of the words that Jesus spoke in the wake of this were quite, quite threatening in many ways. Number two, the challenge of the church. Um, as maybe let me just make, mention a few things about um, the flow of the church. Um, some of the words that Jesus spoke that really hyped people include things like uh, uh, calling himself the, the son of man or the son of God. Um, when he made his maiden speech in Matthew chapter 5, it has been said, but now I see. Basically flipping around what was expected about leadership, about uh, revenge, about all sorts of different things. Uh, when he said to him of himself, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And at the end of it all, he says, destroy this temple and I will build it up in three days. And so it was spiritual um, and it created a lot of conflict, but because it was birthed of God and for God, um, it rose beyond even the wildest imagination, even of the apostles themselves or the disciples who are following Jesus. And then we face number two, the challenge with the role of the church. Um, by 11th century, we, uh, we see the, the rising of the church to such prominence that the emperor Constantine made it the state church. And there happened the merger of church and state, which was a good thing because salt and light has come into the nation and people have acknowledged and said, you know what, this is what should be, uh, that we should become Christian. We should acknowledge Christianity as the state faith of belief. Um, but then at the same time, that is when the conflict uh, of trying to make the church have a, rather than fit into the context and transform the context, we tried to taper off the rough edges of the, of the message of the gospel. <laughs> uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so we tried to to remove the foolishness from the gospel. <laughs> Let me try and kind of try put it that way. Just like, yeah, the gospel is great. We have been made state religion, so just remove a bit of the foolishness, but, and, and let's keep it going. So try to make the gospel a bit safe. Number three is the challenge with the message uh, of the gospel. And this has to do with the content, the content of the gospel. And uh, Paul writes about this in Galatians 1, verse 6 to 9, uh, seeing how he's astonished how people have quickly deserted the faith and the, the grace that has been given to them through God. And he makes this declaration, if even I or any other person would come and share with you a gospel other than that which we had shared with you, may he be eternally condemned. 
what was he saying? He was saying we need to maintain the integrity of the gospel. It should be as it was. If we are not turning or taking it to any twists and turns and corners. Um, the other day I put this, this post out, just share this post on, on my IG. And uh, this came to me after lots of conversation with people who are trying to see how does the gospel fit in to our context. And it says this, this is what I wrote. The first century witnesses, the, or rather the first century witnessed the crucifixion of Christ amid shouts of crucify him, crucify him. The 21st century is witnessing the crucifixion of the gospel amid shouts of modify it, modify it. I'll say this again. The first century witnessed the crucifixion of Christ amid shouts of crucify him, crucify him. The 21st century is witnessing the crucifixion of the gospel amid shouts of modify it, modify it. And this is the challenge of the message of the gospel. The 21st century, modify it. Number four, I shared with us the challenge with the manners of the church, that is the behavior of the church. The gospel was meant to be transformative. It was meant to change our character so that that which I am, now I am not. That which I used to be, Paul talks about being in darkness and moving to light. The things that I used to do before, I don't do anymore. And so this speaks to the character of the church. And we've had so many scandals happen around churches, major things happening going south, and the trust for the church and the message of the gospel has fallen to probably the lowest levels it has reached in years gone by, all right? Romans 12, one to three talks about, you know, the transformation that we receive. Verse two says, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so we see the move uh, of God to not just leave us where we are, but to move us to where he wants us to be. Not just to leave us in the fallenness of our sin, but to move us into a right standing with him and with men. Um, I still remember a conversation that we had talking about the woman who was caught in the act. And, you know, the, the words that Jesus says to her after the people leave and says, woman, and there, is there anybody who has been left of your accusers? And she says, none at all. And then he says, neither do I condemn you. And then he finishes with a short phrase, go and sin no more. This has to do with a change in character, a change in her behavior. Now, it may have been that this was her bread and butter. It may have been that this was her habit. But Jesus does not say, you know what, this is your weakness. He says, no, no, no. After you have lived through this accusation, go and live a different life. Go and sin no more. And when there is no character, when there is no manners in the church, the thing that takes us over is silence. We keep quiet because um, the people in glass houses don't throw stones. And so you keep quiet because I know I have a folly and somebody else has a folly. And what happens is the weak, the, the widow, the lowly, the poor, the unable end up receiving the brand of our silence because where justice is needed, Micah 6, 8, one of my favorite scriptures, he has shown you, O oh man, what the Lord requires of you. And what does he require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Uh, these are bold things to do. These are things that need character. These are things that need resolve. These are things that we have to stand up and say, in spite of what it will cost me, I have to stand and do something to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. There's a lot of injustice around us. What is our voice going to be if we do not have virtue and character within ourselves, if we are not just within ourselves, within our systems and structures? And then the word that I want to share with us in this is the lack of character is the greatest silencer of any message. The lack of character is the greatest silencer of any message. 
It doesn't matter how powerful the message is. If the character is not commensurate to it, then silence falls. And lastly, I share with us the challenge of the relevance of the church. Um, what makes us relevant? Today in many continents, we are struggling with, with the validity or the value of the gospel. Why should I believe? And the young people are walking out of church in groups and saying, we can't believe because we don't see it. We don't feel the power. We are seeing the church is, the world is compromised. There's no fight for the truth. There is no fight for justice. There is no fight for mercy. There is no fight for truth. There is no, the church is not a voice in itself. And we are caught up in a place where we are quickly losing our voice for truth, our voice for justice, our voice for healing, for hope, for the weak, for the lonely, for the broken. Why? Because we are seeking relevance in other ways other than seeking relevance through the word of God. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey you, everything that I've taught you. And I will be with you to the very end of the age. See, relevance is a fruit of commitment to the mandate. Relevance is a fruit of a commitment to the mandate. There is nothing that makes you as relevant as when you commit to the particular fruit. Uh, the, to, the, to the mandate that you've been given. The reason why we see somebody as relevant is because they are living out what they were built for, what God sent them out to do. This is the great commission, not the great apology. And, and the challenge of relevance when we fail to be relevant, when we fail to, when we fail to be true to the call that God has given us, we become a sorry church. We apologize for, for having the word of God. We apologize for some of the statements that are written in scripture. We begin to step back and pull back from things that God has said we need to do. It is the great commission, not the great apology that God called us to. And compromise is the greatest step towards irrelevance. Compromise. And this is a, this is a, a, a statement that goes alongside with just the fruit of of uh, commitment. Compromise is the biggest step towards irrelevance. We cannot compromise and remain relevant. relevant. Any company in this world that compromises the quality of its product will cease to have impact in the market they are in. The reason why Apple <laughs> products uh, you, you know, you, you don't even have to second guess yourself. Do I buy an Apple product or not? It's because they have never compromised on the quality of the equipment they set up to make. They will bang their heads night and day. They will look for the best techies in the world and make sure that every piece, every button, every, every app, everything they install in that machine is, is the best there is in the world. I love gadgets. I love, I love vehicles. <laughs> I, I, I enjoy watching a uh, series on things like the, the making of the Bugatti. That's one of my favorite cars. I may never drive it because of humidity. Uh, but one day, I sit in one of them, you know, and just say, here, your servant Lord has sat on a Bugatti. The next is a chariot of fire. That's the only thing greater than a Bugatti on earth. And I, <laughs> I look at all these uh, uh, the factory production of a Bugatti. And they say the thing is, the, sell, the selling price of a Bugatti is lower than the manufacturing price of the Bugatti, which means they sell at a loss. Every time a Bugatti leaves the showroom, it's a loss of about $2 million per vehicle. Why is that so? Why are you making losses? Because they are not, they are not about making profit. They are about making a statement. We are not about making profit. We're not about being the coolest community. We are about making an impact. It's about making the name of Jesus stand out there. And people ask you, how much did it cost you to do this? You're like, it cost me this, and this is how much it brought in. And they're like, isn't that a loss? You're like, no, it's not a loss. 
I consider all things but laws that I may know him. <laughs> That's what Paul is saying. He lost an amazing career and he never recaptured probably his position in the political, in the business, in the social circles. But what he gained out of it is the privilege of writing more than half of the New Testament. Who knows Paul's colleagues when he was a, a Pharisee? None of us. And it doesn't matter. Why? Because Paul considered what was the highest point of success, rubbish, that he may know him. And that is what compromise does. When we, don't, when, when we compromise the quality of what God has called us to, we compromise our relevance. To this day, Paul is one of the most read single authors on earth. Why? Because he did compromise on his call. It made him relevant for 2,000 years. Who knows where Caiaphas went? Who knows what he wrote? None of us. Doesn't matter. We only know him in reference to Paul. We only know him in reference to Jesus. And so we have a message that cannot, must not, should not be compromised. And when we do that, the whole world will turn and see, here are our people who love justice, who love right, who are fighting for the needs of the weak, of the lost. And, and for me, the camp experience was not just about getting to a place where I enjoy myself. It was a place where it opened me up to begin to understand what my call is. And we are in that business. We are in that business. Unlike the church, every time people come to church, they come on Sunday and leave on Sunday afternoon. They come on Sunday morning, leave on and Sunday afternoon, if they stay that long. Some of us have one hour services. The camp experience gives you seven days, five days, sometimes two weeks for some of those who can afford of being in the same place with this group of people having them in a controlled environment where you can influence them. Um, like I called it yesterday, the mountain top experience. Uh, it's a come away with me moment if you were to read the Song of Songs. Come away with me. And we come away, we pull people out, take them to the mountains, take them to the forest, take them to a, you know, a reclusive place and tell them, here is our God. What it gives you is an opportunity to Keep them away from the natural distractions. We tell people, leave your phone behind. Why? Not because they don't need to communicate, but because we want them to have communion with God. It provides a controlled environment, an atmosphere, where values and virtue can be trans transmitted and transformation can happen without the interruptions of travel, work, media, home, and everything else. It provides sufficient time space to alter values, reinforce positions, and build accountability. You see, when you're in a campsite, one of the things that happens is you begin to, if people are waking up at 5 a.m., you have to wake up at 5 a.m. So even if you never went for devotions at home, you're up. The camp manager blows the whistle and says, everybody out. You learn to pray on the go because the, the environment is controlled. In the course of that, you begin to develop val values, a change of behavior. And values are being instilled. You learn that it's good to do A, B, C, D because all of you as a group are doing it. And we do this for our teenagers effortlessly. Then we reinforce decisions. How do we reinforce the decisions? One, there is the constant repetition. Two, there is people around you keeping you accountable. If we say we are all going to be reading our Bibles at 2 p.m., we are all on our Bibles at 2 p.m., we reinforce the decision by people having conversations around the same thing in smaller groups. And then we have seven days to reinforce those decisions. And then lastly, we build accountability. By the time you're done with that one week, those people you slept in the same tent with have become your friends by hook or crook. Some of the people I went to camp with 30 years ago are still in my best friends list. We've been in each other's weddings. We are raising each other's children. We are raising our children together. Why? Because by the time those seven days were done, we were tied to the, at the heap with one another. I want to finish with these words. And, and, and the reason why I'm pulling us through this whole conversation is because unless we understand what it means to build this community and hope, hope is not about the excellence in terms of the materials we put up in a camp. That is a component of it. But hope is the message. 
Our relevance is the message. Our, our success is in affirming that message and putting it by the quality that God gave to us. How are we going to move forward in hope? Jesus recaptured three things for the church or for the, for the, for the community of faith at, that, at the time when he walked the earth. He had three things, spiritual authority, intellectual authority, and moral authority. Spiritual authority, intellectual authority, and moral authority. And we see this in the verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 5. Spiritual authority says, though we live in, Paul says, though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. We, the weapons we fight with, or the weapons of our warfare, are not carnal. On the contrary, they have divine power to develop, to demolish strongholds. This battle that we are fighting, the influence we want to have through our camps, will not be won by anything but by spiritual authority. That is the authority that Jesus had. It is conflicting, it is countercultural. But when that when we pull up our spiritual muscles and go on our knees to pray for our generation, we see transformation happen. I love one of my good, good friends and one of our models here in Kenya and the chairman of, of uh, ACC, Baba Mumbi himself. <laughs> we call him Baba Mumbi. Uh, Charles Moy has built a campsite. But one of the things that everyone comes from that camp and sees, they say, man, the spiritual atmosphere in this place. What God is doing and speaking to the leadership and to the people who are working in that camp. And then when COVID happens, and he mentioned it yesterday, Charles Mike says, you know, one of the things that COVID allowed us is to deepen our relationship with God. This deepened their relationships. This deepened their impact. This deepened their transformative work. And that in itself was more than we could ever ask for. When people come there, they're not, they're not coming to experience a camp. They're coming to experience Christ in an environment that we have built. Number two, intellectual authority. Verse 5 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of Christ. And yesterday I talked a lot more about this. Arguments and pretensions. Uh, the intellectual knowledge on how to fight against some of these popular, they call themselves, we call it uh, popular doctrine popular, uh, it's almost like the, the, the pop culture of faith. And you say, we demolish these things. Why do we demolish them? Not because we are just argumentative, but because we are committed to the word of God. And it's able to unravel for us. What is a, what is a, fo a foolish argument? What is a pretension? It also helps us deal with our own personal issues. That we can say we, we, we are not going to be pretentious about our characters. And then lastly, he had moral authority. His words, his power, and his actions align. And in verse 2, it says, I beg you that when I come, I may not be, it may, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. And yesterday, I was saying, not the one, live by the standards of this world. We should not live by the standards of this world. And Paul says this. If we do not, and, some, and, and I like to say this, if we do not get our standards from the world, we will get them from the world. Nature abhors a vacuum. And so if we are to move forward in hope, we have to recapture our spiritual authority. The campsite gives us an environment to be able to bring our best out, bring the message out, bring a community together. But it's the power of God that transforms. It is the intellectual authority that helps us develop content that deals with arguments. Today, the young people are asking questions about atheism. They're asking questions about uh, why should I believe in Christ when there's Buddha, when there's, when there's Mohammed, when, what is the difference between these religions? They're asking, they're not asking questions within the gospel. They're asking questions outside of the gospel. So how do we bring them to the knowledge of Christ if we cannot demolish out arguments and pretensions that set themselves up against the knowledge of God? And then how do we take captive of the thoughts that surround them every day and make them obedient to Christ? And so we have to have an intellectual knowledge to do that. And then number three, the moral authority. Having a standard that is above reproach, having a character that is above 
question it because we are living what we believe in. And I say this, if we do not have a character, then we will be silent. When things are happening, we will be silent when the mistakes are happening around us. We will be silent when the world around us is falling apart. And many of us are coming from countries uh, here in Africa, especially where we have a lot of turmoil when it comes to politics, when it comes to business, when it comes to uh, care for people, Medicare, education and all that. And there's so much injustice happening. But unless we ourselves are just in and of ourselves, because we have developed our spiritual muscle, our intellectual muscle, and our moral muscle, the easiest thing for us to do is to keep quiet. And we can turn our campsites into retreat centers or into transformation centers. We can turn them into, into reclusive places to just come and relax and hang out, or we can turn them into a, a military barracks where you come and charge these young people, can charge these teams, and send them out to have an impact. The choice is ours. What will we do with the gospel, the, the tools, the skills, and the connections God has given us? A global community of camp workers can be able to literally spearhead a global revival by what we do with those people who come to our campsites for those seven days. We have the privilege of keeping them in for seven days. The church does not. We have that privilege. And many times it's the young people because they love the camping, the hiking, the jumping and all that. We give them that, but the choice remains ours. The quality of the gospel that we give to them. The power of the gospel that we give to them. The excellence of the teaching and the arguments and the pretensions, again, it's the arguments, pretensions, and thoughts that exalt themselves again at the knowledge of Christ. And the value, the character that allows us to speak with authority because we are above board. May God help us in this conversation. May God help us, each of us, in our various countries, in our various states, because you know where God wants you to step in. And most of the times, it is the place you don't want to step in. For many of us here in Kenya, it's, we know what is happening in our politics. And we know how that it is. And that is the place where the biggest impact on our young people, on our nation, on our community is happening. But it's the most dreadful place to go. May God lead you, not to the place where you are celebrated, but to the place where you are needed. God bless you.